Welcome, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's class promises to be very interesting. Um, uh, Wadia Halabi joins us all the way from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm in Chicago, and everybody else who's on the line is wherever uh, you are. So again, thank you uh, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I think what I'm hearing is an echo of my own voice. I think that's what it is. And so uh, without uh, uh, using too much uh, time, I will now uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Wadi and I will mute my mic. Uh, hello, comrades. Uh, this is Wadia Halari speaking from the Center for Marxist Education uh, in Boston, uh, now in its 43rd year of uh, 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 addressing uh, education and Marxism, uh, specifically for workers. We've been in the same location for 40 some years. Uh, now being threatened by gentrification uh, uh, in Central Square in uh, Cambridge, uh, where we're located. Uh, um, uh, I, I serve on the Economics Commission of the Communist Party and one of the volunteers at this center. Uh, a little more than 18 years ago, I received an unsolicited invitation from uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, based uh, actually on the economics column, the people before profits column in the People's Weekly World. And uh, uh, the column was, uh, the United States was in the dot-com boom at the time and uh, had just broken its record for how many consecutive months that GDP, which is not the same thing as the economy, how many consecutive months GDP uh, had grown without an actual downturn. And uh, the, our Nobel Prize winners at the two ends of Mass Ave uh, uh, provided uh, their explanations uh, and uh, I, uh, the column effectively refuted them, it was relatively easy and provided alternative answers. And the next thing I knew, I had that invitation from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, I knew almost nothing about China at the time other than it was still a state formed by the Socialist Revolution despite uh, campus inroads. And uh, and I thought that it was academics inviting me, uh, but decided to um, uh, take up the invitation. And it turned out to be uh, part of top leadership that was inviting me. And uh, they uh, felt demoralized and confused, uh, demoralized on the one hand by the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, which for all of the differences between the Soviet Union, Soviet and Chinese uh, leaderships, uh, they realized uh, was the same kind of state as China and uh, confused by the seeming stability and uh, seeming wealth in the United States. And so uh, something about that column uh, apparently had hit a nerve and uh, uh, what has followed is prime, uh, uh, it's nearly 30 visits now in the past 18 years, uh, primarily focused on identifying and addressing weaknesses behind the, uh, that made counter revolution possible in the Soviet Union, and secondarily on changes in the world economy and also the US economy. And um, and uh, a part of this work uh, is really based uh, in part in good part on study of what happened in Hungary in 1956, uh, a near counter revolution stopped by Soviet tanks, but where the underlying problems 
were not solved. Uh, so Aftercore's work uh, was quite important. A uh, study of uh, what happened in Czechoslovakia, 68, uh, similar scenario. Uh, again, Soviet tanks stopped the kind of revolution, but uh, the underlying problems not solved. And then a lot of study of uh, Poland, 1980, and how workers could turn against their own state and support uh, this uh, uh, monster called Solidarnosc, uh, led in part by social democrats, nationalists, the Catholic Church. And uh, um, this time there were no Soviet tanks and uh, and counter-revolution followed. And uh, in any case, so that's uh, partially uh, the background behind uh, uh, today's presentation. So. Uh, so let me open really by thanking uh, party leaders uh, who in the past few years have organized what I think is the most comprehensive program of education in uh, almost two decades. And uh, uh, to uh, Comrade D. Miles for all the time and care she has put into this program and also for helping me, uh, for helping prepare for today's presentation, uh, quite consuming. So, uh, and then a reminder that on Saturday, July 21st, the party is going to be hosting a webinar on the Marxist theory of the state uh, led by Mark Brodeen. And this is especially relevant for our topic today. Uh, the topic being learning from the worst defeats in uh, uh, working class history, the counter revolutions that swept 12 states formed by socialist revolutions, above all the Soviet Union, uh, and, uh, and uh, with the Soviet Union, indeed with most of the 12 states, it's, uh, they fell despite tremendous achievements. And not least of these was that labor was consistently in demand. So that if you're 16 and hating school, as I did, uh, but if you were in the Soviet Union or most of these states, you could quit your job, you quit school and get a job immediately. And then if you decided to go back to school, the school was open to you, university was open to you, but there was a constant demand for labor. Whereas uh, our youth and an enormous portion of the population in capitalist countries uh, basically have no jobs waiting for them. They're either unemployed or self-employed and absolutely miserable. And uh, uh, so again, despite tremendous accomplishments, so uh, the Soviet state fell, like uh, the description said, uh, as if termites had eaten the foundations of this tremendous building. Uh, which had at the time the second largest economy in the world, accounting for 21% of uh, world industrial and agricultural production, compared to 23% for the U.S. So uh, um, and that uh, that economy has been decimated since uh, counter revolution. So uh, um, it just a reminder: it's very difficult to establish a new social system. Uh, Capitalism made had dozens of attempts before it achieved its first lasting victory. And uh, it's strictly difficult to establish a social system that seeks to end exploitation. And this is coming out of uh, a society where uh, essentially the culture of exploitation is pervasive. So, um, so that the Soviet that the Soviet Union lasted almost 75 years is absolutely remarkable, uh, and at the same time uh, it did fall. So uh, uh, the guiding principles I try to follow are confidence in the working class, confidence in the communist parties, and our ability to face the truth and to correct errors, and confidence in Marxism, uh, which is essential to arrive at the truth. And, uh, and uh, to develop practice based on the analysis. So uh, again, Marxism isn't just a philosophy, it's also putting philosophy into action. So, um, so this is uh, uh, 
the first of a two-part presentation that mainly draws from efforts in China to a lesser extent in Vietnam and Cuba uh, uh, aimed at identifying and addressing weaknesses that made counter-revolution uh, possible in the 12 states. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense, the decision by the Communist Party of China uh, to organize all Walmart workers uh, and uh, subsequently to organize all workers in Fortune 500 corporations operating in China is one partial result of the discussions we've been having. Uh, the meeting uh, just six weeks ago that our chairman, John Bechtel, and that uh, Carol and another of our leader uh, attended in China uh, with 70 other communist parties uh, organized by the International Department of the Communist Party of China. That's another essentially uh, that le it led from analysis of the Soviet collapse. Uh, basically, the lack of Communist Party unity weakened the entire movement, but also states like the Soviet Union or Poland, or for that matter, China. So uh, uh, a reminder, in, in order to assess the fall of the Soviet Union, we need to look at the whole, uh, the international as well as the domestic, objective as well as subjective factors, the condition of the economy and of the environment, uh, questions like currency and pricing mechanisms, much more important after revolution than people sometimes realize. Um, culture, that's sometimes the hardest to see, but that overall environment uh, is uh, uh, quite critical. Uh, we need to develop that culture of respect and cooperation. And again, this is coming out of capitalist societies where uh, just the reverse is uh, 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 nurtured. So, uh, Looking at questions of organization and of leadership, the application or failure to apply Marxism uh, to a changing world, uh, two-way communications, top-down and bottom-up, and making that effective. So we can't look at all the factors in two short sessions, but what we can try to do is to establish a framework. So. Um, so just uh, as a background, in the, in the 1790s, uh, the U.S. did what it could to try to contain and ultimately to try to defeat unsuccessfully the great Haitian Revolution. Uh, so it helped uh, uh, campus France when necessary. And despite those efforts, again, that Haitian Revolution won. Uh, every effort's been made to... Uh, uh, to choke Haiti since, but nevertheless, but what was the U.S. doing, trying to, helping France, trying to contain that revolution? In 1850, U.S. forces joined the British in helping China's ruling dynasty at the time defeat the great Taiping Rebellion. Really, a great rebellion above all of poor peasants. Uh, and just a reminder, that civil war in China, the Taiping Rebellion, had f about 40 times as many casualties as the U.S. Civil War. In 1871, Prussian and other armies in Europe gave passive as well as active support to the French Army's bloody suppression of the Paris Commune, the first time the working class took power, as well as you know, moved to crush other communes that arose in France uh, that spring. And then in 1918, the U.S. joined a dozen other capitalist countries uh, in invading the young Soviet state to support local reactionaries trying to reverse the Russian Revolution. So, so the question is, what was the U.S. doing in China in 1850? Uh, what was the U.S. doing in the Soviet state in 1918? Never mind Britain, France, and so many other countries. So essentially, 
The answer to that is that Marx and Engels understood that with the rise of a single world economy, workers and our organizations uh, in any one country are essentially up against the exploiters of the whole world. So a starting point in evaluating the Soviet collapse is the global class struggle, a term that uh, Scott Marshall often used. So this uh, part places the counter-revolution in the Soviet Union and other states in a historical and global class struggle uh, context. Uh, the next part, August 5th, uh, tries to identify the main weaknesses that made these defeats possible, in part by looking at the relative strengths that allowed the Cuban state to survive the same typhoon that brought down the mighty Soviet the state. Mind you, Cuba was damaged and it's not out of danger, but nevertheless, that state survived. So, uh, so uh, looking at uh, this, uh, the slide that's on your screen, Campus Crisis, Wars and Revolution, um, the, the slide simply graphs the number of major banking and external debt crisis in the world since the 1850s. Uh, to be exact, it's actually a three-year moving average. So, uh, uh, and a very important part of this uh, graph, which comes from two capitalist economists, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, uh, the uh, source is at the bottom. Uh, but the very important point of the graph is uh, one of the ABCs of Marxism which is that the capitalist class does not control a capitalist economy. Capitalist economies are regulated by the laws of commodity production and exchange, irrespective of capitalist wishes. And one simple way of seeing this is uh, if a capitalist did control a capitalist economy, there'd be no crisis, because crisis ravaged the profits that the capitalists live and kill for. So capitalism hasn't been able to overcome crisis throughout its history. Uh, the dominant capitalists have limited control over who suffers the most in a crisis, short of revolution. Revolutions accompany crisis, really failures of the old system. So if you look uh, uh, at the graph on the extreme left, 1850s uh, uh, through uh, the end of 1880s, uh, you see these periodic jumps in uh, crisis, uh, but they're relatively uh, limited. So uh, uh, what's circled number one on, on that uh, graph is actually points to uh, 1871, the Paris Commune, which accompanied a crisis in part of Europe. Again, this is a three-year moving average, so it's hard to see the extent of the crisis uh, in France and adjoining states that led them to war that opened the path for the Paris Commune. In any case, the important thing is if you look starting about 1890, something very different about the crisis. They're far more severe. That's imperialism. That's the start of imperialism. And what's imperialism? It's essentially when the forces of production have outgrown the limited campus forms. So I'm assuming a lot out of, from Marx, but basically um, Marx identifies campus central contradiction as that between the development of a productive forces and capitalist forms that are just too narrow to be able to deal with uh, that growth in the productive forces. So, um, so the form we know best is private ownership, and we know that under capitalism it it leads to a constant monopolization, and the monopolization and ownership of capital in the U.S. is almost perfect. It's very close to just a few families owning all of the key capital. And Victor Pertl's work uh, is crucial in seeing this. Uh, but in addition, uh, another uh, uh, form, capitalist form that's uh, devastating to the capitalists and their operation of economy is national borders. 
and uh, one, the number of countries in the world has gone up from 74, I think, in the 1890s. It's now very close to 200, and you're seeing the barriers going up and going up, uh, uh, especially in recent days, but really they've, they've gone up much more than people realize, and each border uh, uh, increases these uh, uh, uh essentially this limitation of capitalism. Um, another one is that for a modern economy to function, you need bottom-up control and interest. And capitalism is a top-down only system. You only need one firing, even if some uh, company makes it appear, this is a team and so on, you know, uh, one layoff and, you know, this is a top-down system. So, um, uh, so that so that's the circle two is basically that's the rise of uh, imperialism and of enormous crisis that follow and it's unmistakable in this graph. Three uh, in 1900, again in 1907, again in 1913, these enormous uh, worldwide crisis of capitalism and. Uh, uh, a reminder, crisis affect all classes, but the greatest pressure comes down above all on the working class and, uh, and uh, its movement. Should backtrack a, a second, with the rise of imperialism, uh, a reminder, the United States seizes Hawaii, seizes Puerto Rico, seizes Cuba, seizes the Philippines, moves into China, even little Italy invaded China in 1900, along with six or seven other countries. Uh, uh, so um, in any event, so three points to crisis. And uh, again, it affects all classes, which is in part why crisis can open the door for revolutions. But uh, um, uh, this massive pressure comes down on working class organization. And above all, that meant on the Socialist International, the Second International, which Engels had helped organize before he died in 1895. So, and potentially the Socialist International was one mighty organization. Just the unions formally affiliated with the International uh, had in their power to shut Europe down, which would have prevented World War I. Humanity had never experienced a war like World War I. Uh, and in the process, and in fighting against the capitalists who were driving to war, that could have opened the door for socialist revolutions in a number of countries, in Europe and probably in Japan, where the Socialist International was quite strong. Uh, but the leaders of the International had become comfortable. Um, they... Um, they thought that monopolized capitalism was headed to a world of peaceful coexistence instead of seeing a war coming. And uh, when the war did come, the international collapsed along national lines, along uh, uh, with leaders of a French section, German section, each voting to support its own bourgeoisie in war. And uh, um, but uh, again, a crisis means a failure of the old system and the Bolsheviks, their leaders weren't comfortable. They adhered to Marxism. They had no illusions about the peaceful imperialism. They had deep roots among workers, especially industrial workers and spent enormous time educating in Marxism. So just three years after the collapse of the Socialist International, the Russian Revolution conquers. So, uh, and uh, I consider that the greatest step forward in human history. Um, and the October Revolution is what created all communist parties and the Communist International. So, uh, uh, and uh, the Russian Revolution effectively ended first the First World War. So that's one of its many accomplishments. Uh, but immediately after uh, the war ends, essentially crisis in the capitalist world erupted, and that's a circled four on on uh, the diagram on your screens.
uh, you can draw the parallels between that second wave of crisis then and the near collapse of an unprepared Soviet Union in the fall of 1941 as a result of imperial military aggression, the dissolution of a communist international, uh, but then the victories of revolutions in Albania, in Yugoslavia, in Northern Vietnam and Northern Korea, above all in China in 1949. Uh, and China then accounted for 25% of world's population. Now it accounts for about 18 or 19%. So uh, what seems to challenge uh, Marxist theory was the period of relative stability uh, from approximately 1945 to 1973. Um, uh, a superficial application of Marxism uh, 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 would lead to the conclusion of ever greater crisis, just like after the end of World War I. And instead, we have this almost 30 year period. 28 year period of that relative stability, that's five on the graph. And uh, many in the labor movement, including uh, in the communist movement, began to think that maybe capitalism had learned to regulate, if not overcome its contradictions. For example, by using Keynesian mechanisms, uh, regulation of interest rates, insurance on bank deposits, and so on. It was solving that challenge that led to my first invitation in China. And uh, maybe it'll come up in questions, but I, I really want to proceed at this time to the end of that period, uh, uh, number five, where you see crisis really begin to erupt roughly in 1973 and especially in 1975. And, uh, that's a massive typhoon, as you see at some point it exceeded that in the 1930s. Um, and uh, and uh, this is what I sometimes describe as a campus typhoon that brought down an unprepared Soviet Union, an unprepared GDR, unprepared Poland, and nine other states, including Albania and Yugoslavia. So. Uh, Again, the general model is when a typhoon hits a region, afterwards we find some buildings have collapsed, others remain standing. Why did any building collapse? Typhoon hit it. But how come some buildings remain standing? First thing we look at is the foundations of a building. We look at secondary considerations, like how well built was the roof or windows. Tertiary considerations, like flood control measures, uh, uh, miles and miles away. So, uh, uh, again, not simple. Um, what's partially confusing is that while these crises were escalating in the starting in the mid 1970s, and you see how they're exploding in the 1980s, uh, starting in 1983, US GDP, which is not the real economy, it's not the society, we're just turbulence and tearing up of people's lives. Of, got worse and worse, but U.S. GDP began the most stable period in the entire 200-year history of the United States. So, uh, uh, and we can go back if uh, you're interested during questions, where did that stability come from? So, uh, we, we don't have much time, so let's go to the diagram of, uh, uh, of the world economy. Uh, Uh, because this is crucial. This is basically the material base that we work off of. So, and all that one world economy means uh, is that anything that develops, say, at point A affects point B, even though separated by thousands of miles of ocean or the highest mountains, uh, or uh, in this case, social systems. So uh, um, uh, reasonably speaking, there's been a single world economy for about 500 years when developments in navigation and shipbuilding capacity uh, were put in use. So an easy way to remember, say, 1492. 
but then rail develops in the 1820s, the telegraph develops in the 1840s, and uh, instead of uh, developments at point A reaching point B in a matter of months or a year, now the developments can arrive in a matter of hours sometimes, and certainly uh, uh, days uh, or weeks. So, um, but since 1917, the greatest change in the world economy uh, is that there's been two social systems interacting and conflicting within the single world economy. Uh, capitalism on the one hand, and the social system created by socialist revolutions. So initially that meant only the Soviet Union, but soon it was joined by Mongolia. And by 1976, there was a total of 17 such states, including China, Vietnam, Cuba, Laos. So uh, one point is that ultimately only one class can rule the whole because of profound conflicts in interest uh, and also in the mode of organization uh, between the two systems, between that world capitalist class and really the world working class. Um, capitalist economies are regulated uh, by the boom-bust laws of, uh, of commodity production and exchange and uh, and unavoidable imbalances in the economy uh, inevitably disrupt the economy as a whole and the process of circulation. Um, the states formed by socialist revolutions um, uh, and, uh, am I jumping ahead of myself? Yeah. States formed by socialist revolutions or economies formed by socialist revolutions are basically non cyclical because they're internally regulated primarily by planning and allocation and reallocation of the surplus to avoid major imbalances. So China's gone decades without a bust. The Soviet Union went for decades without a boom bust before it suddenly fell. So uh, then we have two social systems interacting and conflicting. Um, very important is that workers and workers' organizations in capitalist countries have fundamentally the same interests as the states formed by socialist revolutions. And the exploiters of a world have opposite interests. So it, Workers in capitalist countries, again, it's our interests aren't simply the same as interests in, of workers, say, in China. They're the same as a state formed by the great socialist revolution in China in 1949, which exists to this day. So, um, so um, to go back to uh, this uh, question of uh, relative stability, which is very tenuous right now, but hasn't completely broken, is that the states formed by socialist revolutions have been the real source of any stability in the world economy. And in particular, the purchases they make from the capitalist world prevent the capitalist circulation system from freezing up. But uh, the contradictions of capitalism continue to accumulate. And that's why starting despite the tremendous growth, say, of China, uh, you have the tremendous crisis of the 1980s, 1990s, and above all, 2008. So, uh, so again, the source of any stability has been the working class through the states where it's taken power. The capitalist economies, on the other hand, uh, are destabilizing the whole, including the states formed by socialist revolutions. And if you want in discussion, we can, for example, track how the mounting crisis in the 1970s destabilized the Soviet Union, Poland, and, uh, uh, and then internal weaknesses uh, led to a collapse of the state. So, uh, um, but again, those, that explosion of crisis in the 1970s, 80s, and so on are like a capitalist typhoon that brought down an unprepared Soviet Union and 11 other states, 
just like a weaker typhoon in the 19 teens brought down an unprepared socialist international. And sometimes it's easier to uh, see what happened with the socialist international than it is seeing what happens that the Soviet Union could collapse as it did. Um, but we also remember its crisis. It's the failures of the old system that can open the door for victories of a new system. It's the crisis of capitalism in the 1900s and 19 teens that opened the door for the victory of a Russian revolution. It's a capitalist, of a, a capitalist system through the 1920s and 30s and 40s, because these wars are mighty failures of a system that opened the door for the victories of the Chinese revolution, of the Albanian revolution, of the Yugoslav revolution, of Vietnam, Korea. So, uh, but uh, achieving victory, as we saw with uh, the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, and for that matter, the Yugoslav Revolution, remarkable. Um, the, the victories of revolution take the utmost and conscious organization of the working class, uh, above all, on the international scale. So in the next part, uh, Sunday, August 5, uh, the approach is to take a comparative look at the Soviet Union and Cuba to try to get a better sense of why one survived while the other, uh, uh, why Cuba survived while the mighty Soviet Union did not. And I'd like to close at this point uh, to open up for a discussion. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, we will, oh, this is D. We will open the floor uh, for discussion and or comments. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, introduce a question and or a comment, please uh, click your raised hand uh, icon, click the picture of the hand, and it will show uh, that you have a comment or a question that you'd like to uh, put on the floor. And uh, we have time tonight, so um, please, uh, be encouraged to raise your question uh, or make your comment. Emil, your mic is open. Okay. Hey, Wadir, you're looking good. Um, wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, I have a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is very good and your diagrams are very good. And I'm wondering if there's a way that we can get hold of uh, copies of those uh, graphics that you're using. Uh, that would be of great use to our educational work in, in uh, going forward. Secondly, uh, you're going to talk about Cuba in August, but I was in Cuba uh, a year and two months ago. And as I always do when I talk to Cuban folks, ordinary folks and party folks and uh, anybody, I always ask them, why do you think the Soviet Union collapsed and Cuba did not? And uh, their answer is focused each time and very cautiously phrased uh, on how the communist parties relate to the working class and the masses that they don't, they didn't uh, allow it to happen that there would be a, a breach or a, a you know a distance between the masses and the the communist party and then when thinking about that i remembered a book which you may be familiar with but if not i think it's worth looking at again uh, published in english in 1979 in hungarian a little earlier uh, the book is called proper peasants life in a hungarian village and it's by the hungarian uh, anthropologists actually Edith Fell and Tamás Hofer. And it's just an anthropological study of a peasant village in Hungary, but it has an appendix which gives a, a breakdown of the year by year composition of the Communist Party of Hungary, the Hungary Hungarian Workers' Party, in other words. And what's striking about it is the degree to which the Communist Party over the first 20 years of Hungarian socialism, 15 or 20, uh, 
lost its working class and poor peasant composition and to a very great extent became a party of uh, government officials, uh, what would be called in Russian apparatchiki, and uh, other people working in the superstructure. And I never saw anything more by Phelan-Hoffer after that, but I'm wondering if there, what are your thoughts on the way that breaches between the communist parties and the working class lead to an inability to handle responses to crises uh, and open the door for uh, bourgeois penetration of the parties themselves. Actually, when you see the kind of people who ended up taking over the uh, party and the Soviet Union. So I'll stop there, but those are just a few thoughts that occurred to me. Thanks, Emil. Is it okay that I respond, D? Sure. Okay. Uh, so, Emil, thank you, and very thoughtful question and uh, and comments, and uh, certainly uh, one that we'll be trying to address at greater depth uh, in part two. Uh, but in general, uh, the gap between any communist party and the mass of workers is potentially fatal. And uh, that includes parties in power and that includes parties seeking power. So, uh, uh, um, so that was, that's, has been, so I agree with uh, what you raised and uh, uh, in, in specifically using that example of Hungary, you can find something similar in Poland where the party was very close to the workers and the workers had a lot of uh, uh, confidence in the party um, uh, well into the 1960s. And then that begins to erode uh, in part uh, as it becomes more and more as a, a communist party there, the uh, Polish United Workers Party uh, became more a party of apparatchiks like you described but also as a crisis of capitalism uh, was deepening. And again, hopefully that's something we'll address uh, next time. So um, what I have found is that it's, uh, again, we need to take into account so many factors. Uh, this was not like the Paris Commune, which lasted, I think, 72 days, uh, uh, the states that fell above all the Soviet Union had lasted, it lasted 74 years, but many of the others lasted dozens of years and then fell. So, um, so uh, it, it, in, in some ways, I'm almost surprised that they did not fall earlier. Uh, but uh, there's, I realize there's somewhat more forgiveness than I previously thought. In, in, uh, but um, still, again, that gap between workers and party is potentially fatal. Uh, one of the discussions we've been having is the importance of the unions formed or transformed by communist parties in overcoming this gap. So uh, in the United States, for example, uh, the United Steelworkers, especially to a lesser extent, the United Auto Workers, UE, uh, are among unions really formed or transformed by communist party after the Russian Revolution. Uh, Worldwide, in China, the old China Federation of Trade Unions was very much created by the Communist Party in the early 1920s and was quite a force in itself. Uh, it's huge today, but it's not a force because it's subordinated uh, to party and government, which are intertwined, uh, but that can change. And incidentally, it has more members than the rest of the world's unions combined that old china federation of trade unions i think has 
314 million members and adding about 7 million a year. So uh, um, in Vietnam, the unions also quite relatively uh, uh, strong in their own right, also formed by the Communist Party after the Russian Revolution, uh, quite a factor in the survival of Vietnam after the Soviet collapse. And the same with Cuba, and we'll get to that next time. But uh, yes, in general, in response to what you uh, raised, uh, you cannot afford a gap between Communist Party and uh, the mass of workers in particular, the masses in general. Uh, but we have the tools to overcome that. And on the other hand, we have a capitalism that's so bankrupt that it's practically pushing people uh, to us. And uh, <laughs> we need to develop that organizational capacity uh, to uh, uh, to receive and educate and organize uh, the people uh, pushed to us. So when I'm asked, you know, as I've been asked in China and Vietnam, uh, who recruited you to the Communist Party? Uh, the answer is the capitalists did <laughs> their crimes, you know. So uh, I, I better let it go. Ramo, your um, mic is open. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karam Minchuri Suleiman. I'm from Philadelphia. And I remember, in a disheartening thing, I remember I joined the party in 1989. And then shortly after the, the, came the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the thing that I remember is they had a plebiscite. And uh, they had a plebiscite, and 75% of the people voted for a Soviet Union. But it didn't seem to matter. Um, whatever this Velvet Revolution thing was, it seemed to take over. Uh, I want to ask two questions. One, do you believe that the um, the the this revolution, this Velvet Revolution, was a thing that was organized by the capitalists externally as well as the capitalists internally? Um, and two, uh, do you believe that um, uh, that Soviet Union will be ultimately restored uh, since Putin and the CPR, CPR, CPRF wants to see um, uh, the, a new Soviet Union? Um, just to answer those two questions, because I'm excited, I, I'm glad to see somebody is finally starting to address these issues, and I think that the, the whole, in fact, I want to say that your whole uh, lecture has been wonderful. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, again, uh, great questions. Uh, so, uh, were these velvet revolutions organized, say, by imperialism externally with internal help and uh, um, Maybe an easier one to see, and it wasn't so velvet, was the rise of Solidarnosc in Poland, um, where uh, Imperialism was very much involved in uh, uh, helping uh, that develop. And uh, a good book to look at is uh, Victory. That's its entire title. If you give me... Uh, a second, I'll remember the author's name, maybe Schweitzer, uh, simply victory. In, in, in any event, uh, where he points, uh, where he documents uh, uh, U.S. and Vatican support uh, working jointly to develop this uh, monster, Saladarnas, that uh, achieved, that helped uh, bring down uh, not only the Polish state, but the Soviet state. Um, however, that was only possible because of our internal weaknesses. And that's what the uh, August 5th presentation would really look at, is those internal weaknesses uh, that uh, essentially leaders of the state could not resolve for a multiplicity of reasons. So again, this is quite complex and we need to look at the whole picture. But yes, uh, 
Imperialism was involved. It had plenty of collaborators within the state, uh, uh, whether it was uh, Czechoslovakia or Poland, including uh, uh, certainly the Catholic Church in uh, Poland. Social democracy did its job. Nationalism did its job. But uh, if uh, basically the workers had maintained confidence in the leadership in Poland, uh, in spite of all the attempts by uh, this rotten world capitalism and by uh, collaborators and uh, uh, capitalist wannabes within Poland, Poland wouldn't have collapsed uh, the way it did. So again, it's our weaknesses that we need to look at. As to will the Soviet Union be restored? Um, so in China, it essentially been raising the in tremendous potential of rebuilding Marxism and the communist movement within the former Soviet Union. And in fact, all of the states that fell and that have been making enormous attempts to do just that with uh, uh, and the Communist Party of the Russian Federation was among the 71 parties that were at that meeting of Communist parties uh, in Shenzhen in China, May 28th. Uh, and it's been their youth were present and extraordinary two years ago at what are called World Socialism Forums uh, in Beijing uh, held annually. Um, so reviving the Marxist movement uh, is a necessity. Um, the key basically is recommitment by all communist parties essentially to complete humanity's transition from capitalism to socialism. So uh, uh, the Chinese party in some ways is divided between government tasks which are uh, uh, which are uh, largely domestic and involve a lot of compromises internally and internationally, and really party tasks, where the party's fundamental ta uh, commitment is to the common interests of a proletariat, irrespective of nationality. To quote almost exactly from the manifesto. So, um, um, so it's not a decided issue. Uh, I, there's, I think there's reason for cautious optimism about China, which means about humanity, which means about uh, restoring working class power in the former Soviet Union and worldwide. Uh, but the optimism is cautious. And there is a real danger that China could fall like the Soviet Union did. Uh, and uh, we need to do everything in our power to uh, uh, help prevent that and to work with the Chinese party and others in part to re-strengthen Marxism in the Soviet Union. So. Uh, uh, I think that's the best answer I can give you at this time. Joe, your mic is open. Thank you. Um, hi, Wadia, this is Joe. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you um, suggested that there were two primary causes uh, uh, of the collapse, one external, the other internal. Um, I think that the opinion of the world movement and of our party has been over the last 25 or 30 years that the primary cause was internal. However, you won't deal with that until next week. So in, in fairness to your presentation, um, I want to ask you if you 
you you spoke of typhoons, but I didn't get a sense of uh, what were the um, uh, characteristics of that typhoon. What were the primary uh, economic um, pressures that, if you could identify five, uh, that contributed to um, the collapse? Um, if I understood your metaphor about typhoons correctly. Um, I didn't hear that in your presentation. And then secondly, um, the collapse took place within the framework of uh, very specific circumstances in the Soviet Union, and that was uh, the reforms of uh, perestroika and uh, glasnost. And so my second question is, um, um, was it the, or to what degree uh, did um, the uh, establishment of a mixed economy um, uh, in the Soviet Union, um, the restoration of, of, uh, of a capitalist uh, economic forms, um, to what degree did that contribute within the framework of that typhoon you were speaking about uh, precipitate uh, the collapse? So two questions. What were the, I mean, I know it's arbitrary, but I didn't get a sense of what were the five or six main economic factors that contributed this typhoon you spoke about, I didn't hear that. And then secondly, uh, to what degree did perestroika in, in, in the economy, um, that the establishment of a mixed economy, um, this market economy, which was basically a euphemism for capitalism, to what degree did that uh, affect um, the uh, uh, falling apart not only of the Soviet Union, but uh, of the other uh, countries that call themselves socialists. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Uh, so I mean, let, let's look at this typhoon developing starting in the mid 1970s uh really 1973 um there was enormous integration of the cmea states council for mutual economic assistance the soviet union poland gdr um uh, uh i think cuba I think in, in total it was eight or nine states. Um, so just on the economic uh, level, Poland is one that I have studied more closely than others. Uh, the uh, Germany, German banks lent quite a bit of money to Poland to modernize its steel and coal industries, uh, what was called Ostpolitik uh, under Willy Brandt. And it was partially meant as a trap. Um, in any event, the modernized uh, steel and coal uh, production ability came online just as um, a hard crisis hits Europe in the mid-1970s. In any event, uh, the last thing that a Germany was going to do, or for that matter, uh, any capitalist country, was to buy steel or coal from Poland. Uh, so they were unable to sell all of a sudden, but they had counted on proceeds of sale of steel and coal um, uh, in order to repay the debt. And the conditions on the debt were it has to be repaid regardless of economic, political, or any circumstances. 
Um, so, uh, so that throws quite a challenge for uh, Polish officials, how to do it. And their response, instead of uh, uh, saying, if you're not buying the steel and coal, uh, the debt will not be repaid, their response was to place additional pressure on Polish workers. For example, they re-extended the work week, which uh, from five to six days a week, not least in these steel and coal plants, and uh, uh, allowed the standard of living and effective wages of workers to drop. Well, that turned the workers against the officials. And, uh, but also, uh, in general, disrupted the economy. Take a second example with the Soviet Union, and it's out of that book, book uh, Victory, and uh, the author's name, I just got a note pass, was uh, Peter Schweitzer. It's really quite interesting, and the author clearly had, and the work is consistent. Um, and again, just limiting it for now to, po to economic questions. Um, the Soviet Union, in order to meet its five-year plans, uh, depended uh, heavily on sales of energy, primarily oil and natural gas, to the West. Um, what uh, is uh, uh, described in victory and again, consistent with other factors, but you almost need victory to understand exactly how this was unfolding, is the U.S. basically, it was uh, George W. Bush, uh, no, it, I'm, I'm sorry, it was Ronald Reagan. It was a group of five people operating out of the White House. They engineered a sharp decline in the price of oil by working uh, with the Saudis to uh, uh, flood the market with oil. And previously, Henry Kissinger had uh, engineered that all sales of oil and energy would be in dollars. So one, uh, the price of oil dropped very sharply. I think for a couple of years in the mid-1980s, it dropped below $10 a barrel. In addition, the Plaza Accord of 1985, which devalued the dollar by 30%, again, according to Schweitzer, and this is consistent, essentially that was also engineered. And so one result was that suddenly the Soviet Union found that the proceeds from oil and gas sales in the market, in any case that was flooded, dropped by more than 50%. Well, that had an impact, and again, you can see that with the planned economy, it just ripples across the economy and results in all kinds of uh, pressures and dislocations. And uh, the leadership in the Soviet Union was just too willing to try to make deals with imperialism, and in the meantime, uh, essentially, uh, the standard of living stagnated or dropped. Let's add to this. Also under Ronald Reagan, also impelled by this deepening crisis of capitalism, was that uh, the tremendous escalation of war pressures. Do you remember Star Wars? But in 1973, the U.S. actually bared nuclear arms during the October War in the Middle East. The U.S. was one step short of uh, aiming nuclear weapons at the Soviet Union. People don't widely realize that. But the Star Wars uh, 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 and other military initiatives by the U.S. led to necessarily almost as a defensive uh, response uh, sharp dislocations within the Soviet economy. And again, you can't eat tanks. You can't eat nuclear weapons. And uh, so um, there was an escalation in terms of political pressures, not least around uh, the Israeli state and allowing uh, 
migration and placing economic sanctions. Um, Jimmy Carter put a sudden stop on sale of agricultural products to the Soviet Union. Again, has a sudden dislocating or destabilizing effect. So, uh, uh, so you see the typhoon in operation, and again, the way it hit Poland uh, rippled across all of the CMEA states. But what was important, again, and that's what you're raising, is then the internal weaknesses. And that's what the next part two is going to be focused on. Uh, it's those internal weaknesses that led, instead of, as in Cuba, as Emil briefly mentioned, essentially the workers essentially, uh, 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 rallying around the leadership, it led to a gap developing between leadership and workers. Uh, and again, let's leave uh, some of this to the next time. So in terms of establishing, uh, in terms of Gorbachev's uh, uh, initiatives, um, uh, you can see whether with uh, the new economic program of uh, under Lenin or essentially how market forces and uh, opening up in China played out that it was it's possible to use market changes and opening up to actually stimulate the economy. Um, very problematic. Uh, I can un I understand why China did it, uh, but it's come at the cost of a gap developing between a, a party and workers. But in, in the Soviet Union, the way these were introduced and the opening up essentially to uh, bourgeois thinking, uh, the uh, uh, response to the great Soviet minor strikes in the summer of 1989, uh, all of them then just led to a, a growing rejection by workers of the leadership. And uh, to add to this, and this is a critical part, again, you get a sense of the complexity of what's involved, is that the co Communist Party must speak the truth. However difficult the truth may be to address. Otherwise, the masses will, will stop believing us even when we are speaking the truth. So, when that Chernobyl nuclear accident occurred in April 1986, the Soviet masses and the masses of the world learned about it from capitalism. They learned about it from Sweden, not from the leaders of the Soviet Union. And the capitalists then moved to exaggerate the threat from Chernobyl. They didn't say, for example, that the United States uh, uh, had deliberately rained tens of thousands of times as much radiation just with its nuclear testing on humanity than what will ever come out of Chernobyl. It's tens of thousands of times, and that was deliberate. With Chernobyl, what happened was an accident uh, during safety testing. So, but the result, when the workers and masses of the world, including of the Soviet Union, learned about Chernobyl from the capitalists, was that the leadership lost credibility. So, uh, so you're right, the key uh, are the internal strengths or weaknesses, but it's essential to see the strains, the Soviet society was, if left to it by itself, was relatively stable. But there was not going to be no stability under conditions of a world capitalism in crisis and threatening it militarily, economically, politically, in terms of values with Hollywood and so on. There was going to be no peace. <laughs> and, um, and so, yes, that's the internal weaknesses. Uh, were critical.
and again by looking at Cuba versus the Soviet Union next time I think we'll get a better view of this and there are a couple of diagrams that uh, deal with that I hope that answered the uh, or addressed what you were raising Joel John Milton, your mic is open. Yes, uh, comrades. Uh, John Milam from Eastern Ohio. Uh, I was going to comment a little bit on the causes or ask about the causes, but I think we've probably dealt with that, and I see our time's running short. So I want to basically raise the uh, question about the conditions in the uh, former Soviet Union uh, since the uh, betrayal uh, by uh, Glasnost, Perestroika under Gorbachev, and uh, then uh, Yeltsin. But from what I have seen, a, a very good book to read is by uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich. And the title is Secondhand Life, The Last of the Soviets. And she has interviewed numerous sources about uh, the changes during this period of Gorbachev and Yeltsin, and now mainly Gorbachev and Yeltsin. But uh, the thing that most of the responses are uh, basically negative against the uh, democracy. Uh, that Yeltsin promised. Everyone was deluded into believing in some sort of dream, but now they have found themselves in uh, dire straits. And this is uh, worth a read if anyone wants to know what happened afterwards. One of the comments that struck me was one citizen was saying that basically the people uh, sold out their country for blue jeans, VCRs and salami that they sold out a great nation. Putin, in his interview with uh, Oliver Stone, even commented that the worst event in uh, modern history was the fall of the Soviet Union because people were left without a country, even though Putin probably participated more in the fall. And finally is an anecdote from a friend that I used to work with. He was a Polish extraction and he had the opportunity, he was talking about always about the Russian influence and believed all the capitalist propaganda about how badly the Poles were treated. And after the uh, fall uh, in Poland, he had a chance to travel there and he came back very disillusioned with the citizens, because instead of being uh, what he imagined was newly liberated Democrats and good Catholics, that they were bemoaning what they had lost and the safety net that they had lost after the uh, Communist Party lost its power in the state of Poland. So those are the comments that I had to make. So I'll shut up and let somebody else have the floor. How do you pronounce your last name? Milam. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Um, perhaps the most widely viewed film in the world uh, produced in the past two decades uh, was one produced by two of my hosts in China, Li Shenming and Wu Enyuan. And uh, it's about the collapse of the Soviet Union in efforts to understand what happened. And uh, the reason, of course, it's the most widely viewed film is that China is just so massive. And it was shown practically in every school, every party school. There was no avoiding it, but it uh, really is quite interesting. I'm going to ask them to... Uh, to see if uh, they can uh, uh, have uh, English subtitles. <laughs> 
uh, but they interview quite a few people in the Soviet Union. Um, and by the way, for their efforts to understand the Soviet collapse, um, they were attacked by name in a front page story in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few years ago. Um, so, uh, so there are these efforts in China uh, to understand and uh, address uh, those weaknesses that made the collapse possible. Um, and I think one of the important contributions uh, that I made, especially with Wu Enyuan, uh, uh, who helped produce the film, um, was to show how social democracy facilitated counter-revolution in, in the Soviet Union. And one reason that was important was that uh, the leaders of the uh, Chinese CP in the 1990s into the early 2000s, when we began really identifying how social democracy facilitated counter-revolution. And by the way, Gorbachev identifies he as a social democrat by the mid-1980s, before he became the leader of the Soviet Union. Um, but the leaders of the Communist Party of China were considering formally changing their party into a social democratic party. Uh, and that lasted into the early 2000s. And uh, I think uh, the efforts that we made uh, uh, in exposing how social democracy facilitated counter revolution uh, ended that project. So there's no more talk of that. But when they were considering it, they sent out many of their top scholars uh, to Germany and to uh, the Nordic countries to look at social democracy and uh, and, uh, and and changing the party. Then, so, uh, so in any case, I I liked what you raised. But uh, we have to meet human needs, and one of the weaknesses of the Soviet Union was uh, uh, that failure to meet uh, the need. Uh, uh, they met many needs, but uh, not so much in terms of housing, not so much in terms of uh, uh, a variety of services. Uh, China has done that, but potentially at a, uh, the cost of going to capitalist school could bankrupt China. But again, there's reason for cautious optimism. But that failure to meet uh, consumer needs in the Soviet Union the failure to address uh, various environmental questions definitely weakened the state. And why do do you want to? Uh, why do do you want to end here? Or um, I see Joe has another question. Do you want to uh, end here and uh, wait until next time, or do you want to continue? I'm absolutely open. This, this is a, uh, it's quite important. And I've done little else in the last 18 years, but. <laughs> okay, Joe, your mic is open. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Denise. Well, I mean, it's a huge uh, subject um, and you're right, it's uh, very uh, uh, complex, but um, these pressures that um, the uh, Eastern countries were under um, the Warsaw Pact and the CME had been there for a long time um, and the uh, uh, economic uh, and political and military ones. Uh, so I guess my question is, um, but at the same time, the um, ability of uh, the economies uh, of those countries to fulfill the, they were having a lot of trouble. So is it your opinion that um, there was something wrong with the model? In other words, um, with the uh, reforms that were the NEP type reforms that were undertaken in China 
later initiated by Deng Xiaoping were those necessary in the former uh, Soviet Union and, and just not handled correctly? Is that your opinion? Um, and and um, um, you know, because the other thing is, is that with the exception of Yugoslavia and um, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, the establishment of socialism in Eastern Europe kind of met with uh, the uh, borders uh, that the Red Army had uh, uh, secured in their defeat of Nazism. In other words, that um, uh, isn't it the case that there were not thoroughgoing um, revolutions in, in those other countries? Again, with the exception of Yugoslavia, which uh, had carried on a military campaign successfully against the Germans and, and, and the Czech party, which had won an, an election in 1948. And yet still in those cases, uh, you saw um, a defeat of the workers' governments. So here again, um, uh, did they try to do in the Soviet Union too much too soon? And was the was the uh, economic model um, not adequate to generate um, enough capital to provide for the speaking along narrow e economic terms, uh, to setting aside the political issues for the time being, was was that the problem? Um, um, and and therefore uh, was this uh, this uh, socialist so-called socialist market experience uh, the right direction, say for the what the Chinese called uh, them committing political suicide uh, by the um, uh, in introduction of political reforms that they couldn't handle. Um, is that your argument? What do you? So good questions, Joe. And again, to get a sense of the complexity and that there's so much involved. And actually there's more, like I mentioned earlier, forgiveness in terms of the various models. Uh, is one way to see it is that uh, Cuba was the economy was organized much more along the Soviet model than certainly China or for that matter Yugoslavia. So, so I've had comrades from China say to me the Soviet Union fell because. It did not adopt. It did not bring in market uh, changes and uh, and uh, open up uh, while we did. And my response is, was that uh, uh, Yugoslavia and Hungary uh, had much more of market mechanisms and opening up uh, than the Soviet Union did. Uh, and fell, and uh, Cuba organized very closely economically, like the Soviet Union, did not fall. So again, this gives us an idea that there are just so many factors we need to look at. Um, but uh, uh, again. One of the things that really struck me as I was beginning to learn all of this was reading about Fidel Castro's first visit to the Soviet Union after the victory of the Cuban Revolution. After, uh, 
so I think this was in 1963. He, uh, so he, uh, Castro visits several industrial cities across the Soviet Union, and he is met with such enthusiastic support by workers that apparently it was extraordinary. Uh, what Soviet workers, and I hadn't given it any thought, what they were signaling was their support for revolution in the West. And uh, the response of the Soviet leadership was not to allow Castro to visit to tour cities like that again. He would come for a meeting and be essentially confined to the meeting place. Um, what I have found in China, especially in the last four or five years, is almost enthusiastic support among migrant workers and the children of migrant workers, many of whom have now worked in some of these factories uh, for essentially humanity completing the transition. And this in turn is expressing itself in the Communist Party of China. Hence, for example, the meeting in Shenzhen uh, at the end of May for 70 communist parties. They, they invited, I think, about 100 parties and 71 showed up. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, essentially, the more conscious parties are, the members among workers are, the greater the unity among communist parties, uh, the less the chance of a repeat like the Soviet defeat. And, uh, and the, appear the indications are that the Chinese party is moving in that direction. And that's in part a as a result of taking into consideration what led to that, uh, uh, to the fall of the Soviet Union and 11 other states. So, uh, um, and it's not a done deal and we can have an impact on China. It was wonderful that John and Carol were able to go uh, to China for that meeting. And so uh, the work we do here can have an impact and uh, the work we can do in terms of rebuilding unity among CPs and learning from factors in the fall of the Communist International, the disbanding of it, and, uh, and weaknesses in its organization, uh, which, for, among other things, led to a very serious defeat in China in 1927. Um, so... Uh, and I think there's a lot of that going on. The initial response in China was simply to reject rebuilding international communist unity. That's changing now. And uh, uh, so, uh, so again, another factor is that lack of international unity, or at least the venue uh, for our parties to identify differences among our among ourselves, uh, contradictions among our tasks, and uh, and to resolve them as best we could. And so that Sino-Soviet rift was disastrous for the Soviet Union and led China effectively to work out its own concessions with imperialism, which weakened it immensely, uh, but it hasn't collapsed. and. Uh, and it's now assessing all of this in the face of now a massive crisis of world capitalism and an environmental crisis and a danger of war. So I'm calling these the three typhoons, the economic crisis uh, of capitalism, the environmental crisis, and the danger of uh, global war. And uh, those typhoons will certainly uh, affect all of us. And uh, uh, but again, if, let me close by saying 
these failures of capitalism can open the door for the new social system. But it's going to take uh, the utmost in conscious unity uh, to uh, complete the transition. Okay, why dear, let's end uh, at this uh, point. And everyone, uh, please remember to join us for the second session, uh, which is uh, August 5th.